think is a very accurate depiction of dating apps. And this is very much coming from, because um, my past research was on dating apps, literally, and it was on Tinder Metaverse, but it originated from dating apps like Tinder, Bumble, and uh, Hinge, and this sort of the gamification process of finding an intimate relationship partner. And it is very much um, what they were talking about, the core idea of, oh, you're suitable to turn this the compatibility that they have for the data for you know the couple the, the two individuals you're supposed to be together but actually no and indeed that's the current situation and that is coming from the social science point of view um you would um, it would need a lot more than compatibility to build intimate relationship and for technologies they can't possibly do it hi ernestina Hi there. Thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Um, So the digital world is changing by the day and we can see it around us in in real time. Um, Should we welcome this change? Um, Well, in general, to be frank, I feel like it's a very broad topic, a a very broad question even to ask. Like, uh, yeah. Should we welcome this sort of change? Well, anything is changing, to be frank. Well, Aristotle or all the philosophers was talking about, like, you know, you're never going to step in the same river for the second time because when water is flowing and you're in this current period of time that is going to pass the next second or whatever as well. Um, but I think at some point when it comes to the technology, because people, especially when ChatGPT came out and the um, AI and all the different things happening at the same time, a lot of people are more concerned about um, what's going to happen next. Are they going to take over us or are they going to just replace human being in general? Mm. Um, I think that's kind of too early to say anything about it. Or let's say um, because ChatGPT is basically a language processing system, a natural language processing, which you are going through the orders um, and try to like, you know, go through the stack of information and then extract from it and then try to get the answer for you. Um, so it's still not at the stage of like dynamically changing the world all of a sudden. So I would mm-hmm. say any sort of change is happening, we're welcoming it, of course. Um, but at the same time, I would say there's no need to be fear or to like hold any sort of um, like, you know, the intimidated emotions about it because it's not going to come like, you know, it's not going to overtake anything for now, at least. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've heard a lot recently about chat GPT. Uh, and a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of covering in the, in the media um, and there's been a lot of um, voices of concern about that. Yeah. Do you, do you, what's your view about that? Do you think it's justified or do you think it's a bit of an overreaction? Um, I'd say if, well, if people are expressing the um, the fear out of um um out of the reason that well the argument is about like they're going to replace us i think that's way too early to say that because the technology itself is not there yet even um but if people are more concerned about like creativity or for example um there's some like news that i just saw the other day of the headlines one of the lawyers or barristers um was trying to present like um his speech generated by chat gpt because he didn't really really want to do the job which that could be very concerning because um, you're basically using it or exploiting it as it should be a tool to help you to form something instead of um, just not doing your job, basically. Um, And also that applies to, you know, university essays or um, because I teach in universities, I supervise um, master thesis as well, which is kind of concerning because we do have to tell the students that please don't use AI chat GPT or anything to generate your text because it's all detectable at the same time it's only kind of obstructing your way of learning or your way of understanding the world so um i'd say it really depends on what kind of use are you trying to put it on like let's say so yeah yeah so you think it could be used for good but it also could be abused as well yeah absolutely Mm -hmm. i would say there's a much higher chance like right now currently i would say to be abused like to, right. to on the other extent but th- of course there's like a potential for it to happen or to be adopted in different areas at the end of the day so yeah so do, do you think that that could be down to it's because it's in its infancy do you think it's the lack of kind of regulation around it yeah that's, that's the problem the, yeah, yeah yeah i think regulations is very important indeed um yeah. and also um because ChatGPT hasn't been out for that long as well um 
the arguments and then like um well the concept itself or the technology itself is not that novel it's not that new but um for it to be like you know accepted by the public it's still a short period of time so mm. of course with a short period of time you need regulations you need people to um, think about the ethics or to come up with the new technology to try to like you know the you get the detection like system or you get something to prevent it from being misleading to another path so yeah, yeah. I definitely say i definitely agree with that so yeah. yeah and do you think that we're at a point now where there's no going back so we've re- we've passed that point and we're we're going into a future that even we in, to some extent can't control ourselves um i would say um Yes, we did go through the path all the way till now that um, with all the technologies we have right now, it's it is not going back. Yes. Um, Mm -hmm. But at some point, I do think that um, the core idea of what we're looking for is not like completely gone yet or that Mm -hmm. there is still an ideal picture or let's say like it's a dystopia or, you know, utopia thing that it still hasn't been achieved yet. So. Mm -hmm. That requires more technologies or that requires more um, understandings of our own selves, even for ethics or our identities or um, not only exploring what the out world was saying, but also our inner self we're talking about. So it's like a more I think it's a more general topic or it's like a very broad topic to talk about. Um, when it comes to this sort of topics, especially, um, and also technologies is only part of it, I I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And because there's a lot of talk about, you know, AI could potentially replace humans yeah. and do do the jobs of humans. But interestingly, it can also replace humans for other humans. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it, people might, for instance, prefer dating an AI or yeah. forming yeah. a relationship with an AI. Yeah. That's What's true. your view around its impact on on people as opposed to replacing humanity, but actually its impact on each individual's daily life? Um, yeah, uh, well, what you mentioned about the intimate relationship, that is a very good point um, in terms of um, they did come up with some experimental robots that can actually interact in like, you know, um, conversations with you in daily life or even just like do daily stuff like a human. Um, what they're trying to do is, yes, indeed, to try to push it to the angle of forming an intimate relationship. Because nowadays, for some countries, you do have more bachelors than, you know, like the available, the market could hold at some point. Like, let's mm. put it in a nicer way to say it. But um, basically, when there is a need, yes, people are trying to find solutions. And it is potentially a solution for that. Mm. Uh, but at some point, we do need to consider is this going to end up in like um, the novel Brave New World or uh, you're you're just going like, to try to get indulged with this sort of uh, hedonistic like um, or the pleasure or whatever it's containing inside or even just conversations that could be developed in a hedonistic way as well. So um, we're trying to just ask the question of like, are we forming the relationships um or like into any kinds of inter- intimate relationships with human or without human or um trying to develop it into something like even further from my personal view is like no matter if it's human or machines like um it is a solution so it provides opportunities for people who want to go for machines they will go for machines for the people who want to still keep on to the you know the, uh, the the actual human physical touch then it is their choice as well this almost applies to social media, the Web2 technologies that uh, when there is Facebook, you could potentially use Facebook to share with your friends or you could just not use it. There is a potential of you could be an influencer on TikTok or you could just not download it at all. So, yeah, that's that's my personal view. Mm. And I suppose that leads on to the question of, you know, could AI be as conscious as you or me and therefore does it matter if it's a person or a robot or whatever, you know, if it has feelings or it, it, it experiences life, does that, yeah. is there a distinction? Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's kind of almost going further to, um to discussing if we're thinking uh, 
like technologies or robots or AI as he, a human. What sort of right do they have? What sort of responsibility do they have? And what sort of um, things that we need to consider before interacting with them? It's almost like you have, you know, when when, when human beings were born at the beginning, you have infants. And before 18 years old, you have specific laws just for them. And you have guardians to secure their safety. You have like different laws to try to make sure that they grow up all the way till 18 and then all the way like step into the society safely. So for machines instead, you have like a different type of rules that need to be applied there as well uh, because they're not born as um, that you could just nurture them naturally or there is a lot of um, potentials, but at, at the same time, a lot of things that could go wild because mm. of them. So, yes, indeed. Yeah, and I suppose linking that to things like business and uh, enterprise and things. I mean, could if AI do outperform humans, let's say creatively, and they're producing art, that's actually superior to anything a human could produce, for example, or, or producing machinery. Um, it, is there, you know, do you see a problem there? Is there, is that a threat to humans? Um, yeah, well, um, when it comes to art, I would say because the current um, the current art market is more than just like, you know, the art work itself. It's more than the techniques or details or the styles or anything like in specific. Well, if you're recalling all the way back to 15th century, yes, the Renaissance and the Florentine, like, you know, the, the time where like techniques matters and the artwork itself matters. But nowadays it's coming to the period of time that um, being an entrepreneur in the art world as like a whole package, that's more valuable than actual like one or two artworks that you produce. So currently, um, to put it in a plain way, if you're going to get in the art market, you would need a social media at some point and you would need to have commercial collaboration. You would need an identity that is presented to the public. So it is a general process of art creation instead of like before, not, not like before anymore. So for um, AI to replace artists like nowadays with the whole package of everything, it is relatively hard, I would say, because uh, when, the, for example, the auction house or um, the dealers from the galleries or the museums, when they're choosing what sort of artwork is more valuable than the other, they're trying to look for different, um, like different angles, like including the color perspectives, yes, details and the, the you know, the ethics or the, the understanding of art in general. At the same time, they're also looking for the commercial values. So for an artist to be replaced easily by AI, I would say, well, it will take some time for that to happen, at least for the next trend of art market to emerge. And they might do, yes, not like rejecting the possibility. But um, in general, um, I would say it's way more complicated than that. And for AI to replace um, other issues, I'm sorry, mind if I double check like, what what did you ask before? Like, um, uh, I think I extending it sort of beyond art, it could it could 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 AI replicate, let's say, humor, or could AI mm. um, produce a film? You know, could it could it write and direct yeah, okay. a film? You know, do, yeah. could those kind of creative pursuits? You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, for well, I would say for creative, like um, um, for general creativity or any creative products that people produce these days, um, I would say, yes, there is a p potential like, you know, um, opportunity for AI to replace it because it could potentially extend to more resource that a human can proceed at the same time, like in one second, basically. Um, or they could possibly perform a better job in financial market even by predicting where the stock is going or um, which one's going up, which which one is more suitable for the market. They could do a better job. But at the same time, I just think there's a thing that called unpredictability, which is like um, where most of the creativity is coming from, where a lot of our experience, for example, an artist, I, um, I got into the art world like quite a couple of years ago. When you get in 
to the art world when you're exposed to the amount of information in the art history or like you know practice installation contemporary art everything that is happening at the same time um you're expecting the creativity to explode at one point unexpectedly you don't really expect it to come in the next month or the next week or any specific time so creativity itself is more of recalling specific part of your memories and then co like recreate or regenerate it something else so for ai to do this kind of job is kind of like it's kind of out of control it's kind of random that's why a lot of people consider ours to be something that is so beautiful because it's random because you can't predict what's going to happen for AI to do that part of the job is very hard and it's hard to replicate it because everyone's experience is different. Everyone's history is different. Everyone's educational background is different and that makes who you are pretty much. So um, I would say the core value for it to replicate it is very hard. And unless you put everything in, which is possible as well, you might create something out of hand. But um, yeah, I'm in general, I'm pretty positive about this some point and do you think the outlook is positive for let's say digital artists like yourself it, is this a welcome introduction to their realm of work um and can they actually benefit from it i'm thinking in terms of things like nfts mm -hmm. and the and the intersection with artificial intelligence yeah um i would say for artificial intelligence um, to you, for AI to generate specific images, to generate specific arts, for artists themselves, it really depends on what do they want. Do they want a larger, large quantity of work in a short period of time, or do they want something that is completely out of themselves, completely authenticity, as I call it, the authentic self? Well, that's a different topic. Well, um, if an artist is, is truly looking for being the authentic self, then of course, um, AI is a disaster, basically, because they're replicating what you're doing. They're replicating everyone's job, pretty much. But for the people who cares more about the commercial value, for example, or for NFT, which is some of the art is basically based on the commercial value. It is using the token. It is using the financial instrument to create arts. If that's the case, if the goal is basically to earn money out of it, then large quantity of art is a good approach to try to get to um, push that end. If, for example, like um, NFT sometimes require like a, quite a lot of a lot of artists would do a lot of like artworks produced at the same time, which is going to be like what 10,000 issue at the same time. And then with the 10,000, that creates potential value for the market but on intentionally for the aesthetic value or for the artistic value. So that's a different thing to consider at some point. But yeah, it, it really depends of what you want at the end of the day. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. So just moving slightly over to a, another topic. What is the metaverse? Um, metaverse, well, metaverse defined um, in a general broader term is basically a universe. Um, a universe that people are getting in this world virtually and then they're interacting with one another and in this coexisting space, which is virtual. Um, basically, Metaverse is not any specific platform or any specific application. It is this universe. So we're living in this 3D um, universe. We can touch the objects around us. For Metaverse, you're supposed to get in this virtual space and you're able to touch on whatever it's there, whatever is kept there. So that's the basic like you know, concept of Metaverse. And do you see a future whereby we spend more time inside the metaverse than we do in real life? Could could it be that the metaverse is indistinguishable from the real world? Um, I would say currently, well, if you want to get into like, um, current, well, we don't really have a metaverse application yet, but um, if you want to get into this world, you technically need um, equipment, for example, headsets or mm -hmm. VR headsets or any sort of um, any companies that issued the sort of uh, VR things, like you would need one of those to get into the world. So it's not really um, such seamless as you know people would imagine. Um, but at the same time, of course, um, there is always a possibility for it to step it into the world that you're basically emerging the reality with the virtual world. But currently, um, I don't think for the next decades or anything it's going to happen. Um, but in general, there is, yes, um, if you're 
course, when we're saying when we're moving from this world, this 3D world into the metaverse, there's a much larger possibility of what can be created and what can we experience on it. So um, anything you could create here, of course, it can be replicated there. But at the same time, for example, if you want to step in the space, you would need um, the oxygen, you would need this like, protection to step on the sun, to walk on the moon and everything. But um, if you're putting everything, moving everything in metaverse, you could potentially not needing any of the equipments, but have a similar experience because that's what they're creating for it in like at the very beginning to um, create like specific unimaginable or imaginable experience to the uh, to bring it to the general public. And yeah. Yeah. So, mm. yeah I mean, a, a few different companies have kind of tried to trial there are some more successful than others, but yeah. trial a kind of version of it. Yeah. Uh, Facebook come into mind. I think Tinder sort of had a had a um, a flirt with it as well. Um, why hasn't it taken off more yet than you would expect? Is there a trust issue with people? Um, I think at some point, because metaverse itself is not really that publicly accept, um, right. accessible, so. For example, like currently, if you want to get into specific applications, if you want to get in uh, one of the biggest uh, metaverse spatial um, application is called spatial. It's basically called spatial. Um, but in order to use it properly, you would need a handset. You would need to buy the whole thing. And it's quite costly, to be frank. It's not the cheapest thing ever. So for some people, that is a barrier for people to try it out. For some other people, just to think about the idea of, for example, Tinder, Tinder Metaverse, um, to try, try to get in Metaverse to start a relationship with someone that you never know, but only just knew from like the virtual space. It is a very intimidating thought and it's a very intimidating idea to even start because you want to build from trust. Um, some people just naturally don't like enjoy the thoughts of technology being interfering the um, interfering your in, intimate, intimate relationship building. Um, and this has been, you know, one of the media centered like topic as well, because, like, you know, you get Black Mirror or you get this sort of sci fi series that insanely focusing on um, the negative points of how virtual technologies will not so not being so beneficial to human interactions. So it kind of um, it kind of leads a whole situation directing into this angle of um it's not really being encouraged but for the people who like the idea who enjoy the idea i think there is also um because you know the specific companies we're not going to mention like the name of it but um they it still requires quite a lot of efforts to try to improve their experience improve the user experience and improve what they can do and sometimes that could be a problem when not a lot of users are engaging in this sort of platforms so the current situation is, firstly, you get people who never tried it before, don't like the idea. And then you get people who tried it before, but the companies can't afford to develop further of the ideas. And then by the end of the day, like, who do you want to track? You, you only get these two kinds of people currently. Like, you, if you want to get more people into this project, of course, like, you know, coming from a marketing point of view, you need to let them try. You need to let them have being accessible to the thing. But currently, it's not possible as well because it is a very costly issue you can't just let it for free so um not until that like time comes in um like you know it's almost like the issue yeah i'm sorry mm -hmm. so so you think that the thing that will or the straw that will break the camel's back is investment marketing when they decide right the time is right to push this you know really push this people will jump on board well, I'd say it requires a much more, um, like, it requires a breakthrough, I'd say, because currently we're kind of at the edge of, okay, yes, no, yes. Some people are losing interest, some people are not, but it's almost like when iPad is out for the first couple of years, or iPod, um, it became a thing later on instantly because the price has been more acceptable than before. And then the stuff itself is very groundbreaking. Um, currently, we need something that is um, more groundbreaking than just 
oh, we're providing the ideas that, oh, you're being able to like, you know, step on the, step into this world and this and that. And also, if you take a look at the applications nowadays in MetaQuest, um, or just take an example of MetaQuest, because it's one of the biggest anyway. So um, if you take a look at the applications that they have right now, like a lot of things are very, very similar. Um, if you have to pick one or two that is like exceptional, that is great, that is going to be groundbreaking for anybody who use it to like, you know, have a true feel of uh, metaverse or virtual reality or even just XR. There could, yeah, you could pick one or two, but there, remember, there are thousands of applications there. So the actual quality of it, because I did came with um, did art design, like a game design background as well. So you can just see and view it from like not all aesthetic value, but also the game section or even just experience section. Let's just put it that way. It's not the, really the best for now. Mm. And there's a lot mm. to be developed, of course. Yeah. And when that development sort of comes to fruition, people will, you think people will, won't be able to resist. They'll just see it and think, this is so good. I want to be a part of this. I would say more often is um, for people who, when things like that happens, okay, um, it's more for the people who've never tried it and give them a chance to try it. Mm -hmm. And for some, yes, I would say it will be a converting situation. They will be converted. Uh, for some, if those two resist it, we're not pushing it further. Like it's, um, there's always a thing in marketing. It's um, you always you always get like what 30% of your audience and your core customers are those people. You're not looking for the rest of the 70% because they're initially not interested into your ideas and stop pursuing them because you're going to lose a 30% as well. So um, I would say because currently it's still targeting towards this like you know small group of people instead of the general public then the idea of how to do it should also be suitable for that situation as well i see and do you think this is quite a general question but do you think it will make people happier a metaverse in general yeah so the 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 more involvement that they have i suppose including ai as well yeah that this technology and it could be a, an integration of the two, but do you think that people will live happier lives? It's a very difficult question, I know. <laughs> I think, well, I think it's a very, um, at some point, happy could be defined as a very subjective process. Mm. Um, it's almost like if you ask me, are you happy today? I was like, ah, nah, sorry. I never really say I'm super happy unless I'm accelerated to tell you something happened like today um i would say it would also be a little bit problematic if one or several technologies um are making people actually happy all of a sudden i think that's kind of a warning sign of this is probably not heading to a right way as well um it's almost like if you ask anybody um if um, the introduction of specific drugs are they going to be make you happy and yes medically my might be it will lift up some part of your the chemicals in your brain is going to be the neurons and you know it's going to help you you're going to feel more pleasure yes indeed for some type of it um but at the same time i think it's also good to consider that um what sort of happiness are we looking for here um because you know people get values and different values lead to different types of happiness happiness um for stoicism like stoic um it's more about virtue more about like you know if i do specific good things i will be happy well then i think it's very hard to accomplish that if you're using metaverse um for but for like you know um, hedonistic like you know enjoyment and stuff like you could potentially yes get a lot of it um, through it um i think it's really it's a very personal experience i would say but of course the goal for inventing these things are to bring benefits, not to torture ourselves. Well, like, if you, of course, there are people enjoying torture and we welcome that, but we're not rejecting that idea as well. But um, of course, like, you know, if that brings more joy for them, I would say it's beneficial for them and it, it will bring happiness for them at the end of the day. So, yeah. 
Yeah. So I think there's a difference between benefits to society and benefits to the individual, because you could argue that, you know, somebody might be very happy in McDonald's every day, every Mm -hmm. meal, but it's not necessarily healthy for them. So that happiness might not translate into healthiness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for the social goods, like, um, let's say for, for the community, for the general um, society, I think it's a much broader term of, well, that's what the government should be thinking about at some point of um, how it will be applied. And is it, should it be advertised even to talk about like McDonald's in public about it? Or should we just, um, I think in that way, it's a much um, broader perspective to view a single technology. And of course, it's not I would say yes, it concerns to everyone. Yes, indeed, because you are the people, you are the individuals that construct the whole society. We don't need trees to construct it at some point. So, um, but but I do say like you know, uh, it is a very different topic, indeed. Yep. Yeah. Um, and also, what's your view on the impact or the contribution of bots in? these um, interactions that we will have with technology and will their influence grow more and more and do you see uh, any repercussions from that i'm sorry mind if i just double check like a what um like yeah yeah like bots so i suppose um uh you know fake entities Mm. uh, that might look human but aren't and are actually there or could be could be there for malicious reasons mm-hmm. and do you think that the growth in those entities could become more problematic um yeah well i do feel like um everything exists for a reason at some point that i always argue um if something just um it will either it will cause yes uh, potentially positive effects or negative effects for example the phishing information or the fake information but at the same time you would be able to reflect back on um what's wrong with the situation so i would say their existence definitely reminds us of um there are problems issues for example with authenticity or protection for um, underage or protection for specific things or privacy um i think it, the problem itself won't be going away easily. And the reason why it's not going away is for a reason. And what we need to do is to find that reason and then try to dig it out of what, what's going to happen, what's the next solutions for it. And that applies to most of the technology, I would say, nowadays. That, um, For example, when you say, like, you know, when you're in uh, metaverse, there are different um, issues with, for example, sexual harassment in the virtual space and how are you going to try to maintain it how are you trying to protect people from like you know keep doing it or from protecting people from like like the victims from going through it again and this has been like a very ongoing issue the whole time because there hasn't been any sort of laws the only laws the only regulations they could issue was potentially um tell the users to get away from each other most of the time to not interact with another in the shorter distance which is which is kind of like cut the whole meaning of what we're doing so that's going back to the topic of like you know when we're um, identifying there's a problem yes there is a problem we need to find out how to deal with it and how to come up with a solution or um trying to find the reasons for it so yeah and again it's probably quite a broad question but yeah. how quickly do you see do you have a time frame for how soon a lot of this technology will be fundamental to our lives because at the moment a lot of people can live without a lot of these technologies but there will come a time where we have to everything will rely on them do you see a time frame for when that could be um you mean the whole general technologies or any specific technology um i would say ai vr um metaverse things like that things where we we need to use them in order to function in our daily mm-hmm. lives. Mm. Um, I think for a time, for, for a specific time frame, I think it's kind of hard to say for now. 
Um, but I would say it's very possible for next couple of decades, I'd say. Still still need a bit of a time. Um, I'm putting up a couple of decades because, um, well, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we say, um, nobody has actually thought about, uh, you know, have an iPhone and the smartphones and everything. And it's been very quick. It has been very quick, it has been very fast, and it's sweeping around everything, and um, it just got there. And now everyone is having an iPhone. Um, for NFT, that has only been out since 2021, early. Well, it's been out for a while, but when it actually goes mad, it was basically 2021. So that's only two years ago. Um, so for everything that is happening right now, it's very, it's very sudden. It's very quick. It's very immature at the same time. So... Even though it has been infiltrated our daily life for quite a lot of it, like um, you might heard it from news all the time. You might heard it from, you know, if you work in the fintech, you might heard it a lot, like different technologies trying to be applied to the online banking or to the banking system or economics in general. Um, a lot of universities are teaching the courses. Well, my PhD is basically in NFT, which was never a topic before even. So it will infiltrate our lives easily and quickly, yes. Um, but for us to actually adopt it for the general public, I think it's it still takes some time. Um, for for example, like ChatGPT or um, the AI generated arts, I think because it's quite easy to get access to. It's quite easy for people to just put in some words or ask a question and you'll get the answer. You don't need any sophisticated framework or technology or um, knowledge of specific things. You don't need to know finance to do that what that makes it easier that makes it more accessible that makes it more um it, it, it will go into people's daily life like in a much quicker way than the rest of the things so i would say for the rest of the technology instead of more related to specific like um, professional knowledge i think it will take quite a bit of time but for those technologies the easier that you make for customers to use it the quickly it will get in and for good or bad like um you you kind of need to get used to it as well at that stage at some point so yeah and you just touched upon nfts and that's obviously your area of expertise you've you've done a lot of research in that area um do you want to just explain really briefly kind of what that is and how it could be used or benefited by people yeah mm -hmm. Um, so NFT in general is non-fungible tokens. So non-fungible non tokens here, we're referring to a token that is very distinctive from one another and which this characteristics is very much applied to arts, which you don't want anything to copy from one another. Fungible tokens here, we're referring to um, like Bitcoins. That is one value can be traded for another value. It's exactly the same thing going on. So for non-fungible tokens, it is based on the cryptocurrency, the blockchain system. Cryptocurrency, you could see it as like a type of currency that everything is gener by, generated by computers, machines, with 64 digits of a unique code when you're trading. What makes the difference um, out of this from any other currencies is basically it's generated by machines first. The smart contract is already drafted, so you would have your own contract that has been signed and have a unique code to identify this as a contract. So all the finance system has kind of changed when it comes to NFT or cryptocurrency in general. So because NFT itself is relying on this financial instrument, so a lot of the um, ideas are your finance has changed in accordance. So how it might be beneficial? Well, it is a very long term thing, I think it's um, because non-fungible token itself is a token. You could technically apply to anything, not only arts, but also membership or um, tickets or anything that is like, you know, one of the country club or like unique club that you want to get in. Um, so like this, the application itself um, is very broad for NFT. And what it is bringing us is trying to replace the banking system or the authority, which is you have a centralized system by the decentralized system, which is with cryptocurrency, you have computers to trade. So trying to replace human with that. And that is something that is very uh, 
groundbreaking, I would say, because mm-hmm. um, you are trying to dismantle the system of you have a central bank, you have a banking system, you have derivatives like um, different institutions to drive the derivatives. And that's going to change the whole dynamic. And that's something that is bringing up to the table. So I would say it has more potential, like potential values or potentiality itself than for now that we could provide, okay, this is a benefit and this is a drawbacks. And so, yeah. Mm-hmm. And do you need to be someone who's capable of producing a piece of work that would be valuable or seen as valuable for its artistic merit? Or could anybody get involved in that and contribute to the market? To be frank, um, to anybody could do anything. Um, there's no restrictions. And for some market, um, you would require like a whitelist invitation that you would need to be verified as an artist first. But for some other like, you know, um, participants, it's easily that you could just do anything about it. It doesn't even have to be like a conventional artwork. Um, for some, uh, one of the tweet in 2021 or two ish, um, it was sold quite a bit, like a couple of million, I think, um, because that was the first tweet that was ever existed in on Twitter. And because of the historical value, it has been considered as almost almost like conceptual or contemporary art because this is unique and this non-replaceable and it's the historical and distinctive value that exists there you can't really change it for anything else you can't replicate it and that's something as well so it creates this sort of possibility or opportunity for anything to be turned into art or anything to be called art as well so yeah i see and are there any risks involved in that process because it sounds very um there's a lot of opportunity from what it sounds like but there's also I'm, I'm interested in what what the negative aspect would be yeah um risk there are potentially a lot of risks exist as well because of the regulations as well um one of the first thing is basically the security of um cryptocurrency itself uh, the security of your wallets because you're gonna get like um you have your own wallet and you have your own password, and that's pretty much it. It's not linked up with anything else. And if you lose some money, nothing's gonna help you to trace it back because all the transaction on cryptocurrency trading is um, non-governmental and no governments, no banking system, no police, or not anybody can interfere with it. So this could cause potentially a lot of problem for um, people who are not doing the actual legal trading at some point. Um, it could be a potential way for them to you know, do some specific criminal things. Um, but at the same time, um, the security for it and also the replicate of artwork itself. Um, there hasn't been a, like an actual authentic, like authenticity checking system for it. So for people to replicate someone else's art, for example, the ma- master's art that, um, master's work that the master has never been on social media before. So he didn't even know his existence. You could potentially just pretend it to be him, him. And nobody really knows who's behind it. So that could cause another problem. And of course, at the end of the day, for people who are consuming such products, there is a huge, um, I would say, I wouldn't say negative, but it's more of like the reality of because it's not stock market, but it's very similar at some point. So the crypto, the currency itself, you could get into the market and try to invest into it. But there is no system to try to avoid any loss. So there is a potential chance for you to be homeless overnight um, if you invest too much on it, because the market itself is very volatile and there is no system to support it currently because it's not as um, mature as any other systems, any other financial systems. When it comes to this sort of independent um, financial systems, like you could call it financial at some point, financial technology, um, there is a lot of risks that is involved. And for some people, if they're getting into it, well, it's very hard to tell them to fall back. So um, that could be potentially a huge drawback as well. So, yeah. And I suppose on the other hand, is there potential for somebody to get rich? Oh, very, very likely. Yes. And like in 2021, um, one painting was sold for 69 million. Um, And this has never happened before. And for a painting to be sold, 
and it's not let's be completely honest it's not really identified by any historical um, or let's say aesthetic value out of it it's it's a digital work and in 2021 that year um at the very beginning um ethereum was cost about like uh three thousand bucks ish so that was one ethereum one coin so back in the time in 2021 it has made a lot of millionaires overnight it is indeed an overnight issue and if your artwork has been sold or resell it or instantly trading it for art artists um every trading they get you could choose up to um, a certain percentage of um, the the commission fee every time every time anybody is trading. So the more money they're making as an investor, the more money the artist is making, and the market itself is more money generating. So that has indeed that is also one of the reasons why a lot of people are getting into NFT in 2021 and 2022 because. A lot of people just became millionaires or billionaires overnight without even recognizing what's happening to the market. So it creates possibilities, of course, but also creates, you know, chaotic situations after a while as well. So, yeah. Is that, though, a case of kind of first come, first served? Is that because they were the fir- one of the first people to engage in it when perhaps it hadn't been um utilized or used to its potential and therefore the more saturated it becomes the less probability there is of getting those reaping those benefits um i think it's kind of um it's kind of a situation of um initially well initially nft has been out years ago it was way long ago before 2021 um cryptocurrency bitcoin blockchain was way before 2007 ish like 2000 something uh satoshi the person um living in the u.s like he um still nobody knows who he is to be frank um but he started it and nobody really understands at the beginning um back in the time if you get one coin which is less than a cent or something at the very beginning um but to nowadays or to last year, that's like what Bitcoin costs like ten thousand ish or something. I'm not entirely sure of the current price right now, but um, the change is dynamic. Um, but at the same time, the reason why it explodes in 2021 or um, ish that time is partially thanks to the media, thanks to the media, thanks to a lot of um, different institutions start getting into the market at the same time because a hype situation happens. So everyone is getting in and everyone wants to get a bit of it. Nowadays, uh, when a market firstly emerged, it needs this sort of strike. It needs a boom at the very beginning so they could develop. But for a market to like being sustainable, you need a further strategy. You need a system, you need regulations, you need people to manage it. But currently, the market itself is not really as booming as before because the regulations itself is not being sustained. Um, there hasn't been figured out a way where the people are trying to. People are condemning it for, for example, environmental problem before. And they did. Ethereum did come up with a separate solution for it. They did try to come up with the sustainable development, um, you know, sustainable solutions for creating or even mining. And that helps. But we need more than just one company or one coin or one thing to be done. We need a whole package of things to try to move to the next step. Of course, um, it always generates different possibilities as well. It might not be the same thing in the next 20 years as well. If that's the case, then we'll we'll welcome something else as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, there's always potential for it to evolve or turn into something completely different or yeah. something else, as you say, to come along and supersede it. And um, it, yeah, it's hard to predict, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, and obviously you're a digital artist yourself. Um, you know, what's your um, personal experience of being involved in this kind of work and how can people gain more of an understanding of it? So, so they feel confident in, in in being involved in it themselves. Yeah, um, I think as a creator, it's very much a way of exploring. Um, 
you kind of um, try to explore the situation yourself first and then trying to find opportunities through it. Uh, for people who don't really understand the market or the system, how it works, I think it's very beneficial for people to learn it at the very beginning. I think learning is a good process for um, an artist to try to open up their horizons and try to understand um, and explore how the market goes or what sort of market should they get in and try to identify where to go next. Um, because the art market is not like before or the art create, like, you know, just in general, the art scene is different. You can't just like do your own thing for the next 20 years and not telling anybody because it's not, people are not going to be attracted by that. You need a much more um, either active social media presence or you need commercial collaboration, you need to draw on luxury bags that became one of the thing for some flowers. Like um, it needs a much more, um, I would hate to say it, but art is definitely getting more commercial than before. And for fine art to go further, to not lose this potentiality, it needs to combine with something um, that is out of their own disciplinaries. And I think it's it's a great chance for us to explore how it can do with business in general even. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like there's a degree of influence depending on who produces the work and the, I suppose, personal profile of the person. So is there a benefit in terms of, I suppose, self-promotion in, in pushing your brand of art and therefore increasing its value? Is that fair? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is for branding and stuff, I hate to say this because it sounds very far away from fine arts and fine arts hate to talk about commercial stuff. But um, I would say there is a very blurry line right now. Branding itself, and it is indeed very, very important. Um, like when pop arts starts, um, Andy Warhol, um, it's, he's not really creating something out of hands of, you know, a Da Vinci, painting no it's not it's commercialized and he's very outspoken about it and he did say that it is commercial and i like the mass production so he embraced industrial production and that from that moment it changes how fine art should be considered or conceptual art or pop arts and because of that the contemporary art scene has diverted away to well you could of course go into the way of keep doing experimental art, which is something very niche still, like in fine arts, getting into galleries, uh, museums. Um, but if you're considering as a job, taking it as a professionalization of, you know, considering yourself an artist, I think it requires a lot more than just um, creating it or doing it when nobody understands what you're doing and try to explain it. I understand. I respect that as well. And I used to do that as well. But there is a lot more hurdles than you imagine if you keep doing it as a full time professionalized uh, job. So, yeah, I see. Um, and I suppose just going on to your you mentioned, obviously, um, you've done digital art yourself. Yeah. Um, is there anything coming up for you in terms of your work um, that you or where can people see your work? Yeah, sure. Um, I do have a website, um, so it has most of the updated works, a couple of exhibitions lined up. So um, currently I'm focusing on um, experimenting kind of digital and uh, like the experimental videos and some of the stuff are also um, physical and experimental art like all together. It's kind of um, trying to blurring the um, disciplines as well using the art practice practice. And um, currently, yes, I do issue my own NFTs as well, just to try it out a little. And it has been a very interesting experience. So I would definitely encourage us to have a look and, you know, um, try to explore the space. Um, I think currently most of my focus is on the art critics. And also, um, like, of course, I because I supervise students and teaching in universities right now. So um, majorly I teach business and also from the art perspective and also finance as well. So it would um, most of my research is kind of focusing that way as well. So um, if you're interested, feel free to have a look at my website. And also um, 
there are different like contacts out there that you could just find it like just by Google in my name. Easy enough. So yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, one other thing I did want to just ask you. You mentioned before Black Mirror, yeah. and I'm I'm a big Black Mirror fan. Yeah. How how accurate is that to the future? Um, I would say, um, well, okay, I'll start with my personal experience of two years ago. I was a producer. I was a movie producer. And I did produce a movie, which is very similar to Black Mirror, um, but it's a different sci-fi thing. Um, I think there's one thing that we all need to focus, like, need to like separate it from you know the actual series is the theatrical intention out of it anything when we're creating in front of scene or um to do it like a series or movies we're trying to create the extreme the very extreme situation that's where the dynamic is coming from that's where the drama is coming from that's why you see like you know 10 people in the same movie they all know each other somehow and they're all killing each other because that's movie and that's serious that's how you draw attention, so not focusing on your daily life to watch that. Um, so I think at some point it is very extreme with Black Mirror or like, you know, if you ever watched Inside Number Nine, some of the things about morality, about like technology, it's very extreme. Yes. Um, I would say some of the stuff, though, they touched, uh, for example, about the dating. Uh, I think the season five ish, there's a dating app. Um, thing that you just reveal was it the yeah revealing the the time and the compatibility and this thing. yeah I remember one that was where they were in a kind of virtual reality and they didn't know yeah and yeah. then they real and then it actually was matching them as perfect matches but they didn't realize yes. yeah yes exactly well that episode personally I really like it because mm. um, I think it's a very accurate depiction of dating apps and this is very much coming from because um, my past research was on dating apps, literally, and it was on Tinder Metaverse, but it originated from dating apps like Tinder, Bumble and uh, Hinge and this sort of the gamification process of finding intimate relationship partner. And it is very much um, what they were talking about, the core idea of, oh, you're suitable to this, the compatibility that they have for the data for you know, the couple, the, the two individuals who are supposed to be together, but actually no. And indeed, that's the current situation. And that is coming from the social science point of view. Um, you would, um, it would need a lot more than compatibility to build intimate relationship. And for technologies, they can't possibly do it. Um, what I'm referring here is like, you need, you know, common interest, or we're sorry, common experience together, the common um the experience that history or anything that you're experiencing together um that's why also a lot of the social science um literatures or um, research we're talking about like when you're going on first date for example that's just like a, a, a kind of anecdote out of it um for, on the first date it would be preferred or preferable if you get in the cars to go in the same direction because you need common direction and you need common history together and this has not really been um you know, adopted in most of the technologies when they're trying to find partners or what they're trying to do is, oh, we push you the data, but data is not everything as well. So I would definitely agree to some extent it is very accurate, um, but hopefully I will not end up in that situation as well. I wouldn't really want to as well. So um, I would pray that it would not be the actual situation, but and preferably I, I'm very like a conventional traditional person as well even though I do all the research of technologies mm. but um yeah 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 I mean it, I suppose in theory it's it's an ideal scenario that an, a, a, an app or an AI could just match you with your perfect match but actually as you say the factors the the formula is much more complex and intangible and um nebulous than we could ever understand and perhaps Absolutely. could ever be understood yeah indeed yes yeah. yeah um yeah Ernestina it's been an absolute pleasure talking to Thanks. you um I've learned so much and um thank you very much for sharing your expertise um, Absolutely. my pleasure it was a really great talk thank you thanks for watching I'm sure Ernestina will be back on the show at some point in the future so I'm looking forward to speaking to her again 
There's going to be more episodes coming up soon with some very interesting guests. You can get the episodes on the usual platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts and on YouTube, obviously. So until then, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll see you again soon.